So, um, first of all, I wanted to explain a bit uh, what we will do after. So, we have a panel called the Grey Zone on the illegitimacy of target killing by drones uh, with uh, John Goetz, Chantal Meloni, Marek Tuzinski, moderated by Laura Lucchini. But first, I would like to show a video contribute because as part of our panel, we were also supposed to have uh, two great uh, women from uh, Gaza, Palestine, and unfortunately they are not here with us for various reasons that uh, I can explain you. Uh, one is Asma Al Ghul, and the other is Eba Retzek, and uh, first we really tried hard to have uh, Asma with us, uh, but unfortunately it was not possible to make her go out uh, of Gaza because uh, what she told me that is she is in the blacklist. And at the same time also Ebba Retzek uh, could not come because uh, uh, if you want to go out of Gaza right now, uh, it's really complicated because not only you should have the visa of the country that is giving you hospitality, but at the same time you have also to have the permission from Israel to cross the border, because in the past it was possible to cross, to cross the border in Egypt, and now this border is closed, so the people from Gaza can only go out through the border of Israel. This means that then is Israel that has to issue a permit for them to go out, and uh, you never know if you get this permit. And unfortunately, we didn't manage to have them with us. And Eba Redzek is uh, a Palestinian blogger that is uh, also an activist and working for Amnesty International. And uh, Asma Al Ghul instead is a feminist journalist that works for the Ramallah-based newspaper Al Ayam. And uh, she's also um, really fighting for the v violation uh, of civil rights in Gaza. And uh, recently she got uh, in, uh, the Courage Awards uh, uh, from the International uh, Women Media Foundation. And uh, last August 2014, uh, nine members of her family were killed in an Israeli airstrike in Rafah. So we ask uh, Asma to uh, give us a video contribute because she could not be here, as I say, and fortunately we managed to have that. So I would start this panel with this video contribute. She's telling us the situation in Gaza and also the use of drone uh, in Gaza and Palestine. And then I will leave the stage uh, uh, to the next speakers that will be moderated by Laura Lucchini. I just introduced Laura briefly, then she will introduce the panelists. Um, she is the intake editor at the international video news agency Ruptli, and she worked before for El País, L'Inchiesta and La Nación. My name is Asma'il Ghul, a journalist from Gaza. I thank you for the opportunity to talk in the Mu'tamar. وبشكر المنظمين بصراحة كنت بتمنى أني أنا أشارك في المؤتمر ولكن ظروف المعابر وإغلاقها ما سمحليش طبعاً بالنسبة لمعبر إيرز بيت حنون المسيطرة على إسرائيل كان صعب كثير أن أطلع من هناك لأني أنا موجودة على القائمة السوداء مش عارفة ليش هو نص الشعب في غزة موجود على القائمة السوداء عندهم طبعا انا بدي احكي عن الوضع في غزه او اول شيء بدي احكي عن موضوع المؤتمر اللي هو الطائرات الاستطلاع او الطائره اللي بدون طيار طبعا احنا صرنا حافظين هذه الطائرات او صار عندنا خبره عسكريه من كثره حروب يعني ثلاث حروب في في ثمان سنوات خلتنا نعرف اول ما تدخل طائره الاستطلاع لاصغر طفل بيعرف انها دخلت سماء غزه طائرة الاستطلاع أو الطائرة بدون طيار وفي العادة منسميها الزنانة طبعا هي صوتها في ضجيج بعطي ضجيج زن معين تخرب القنوات لو احنا بنحضر تلفزيون طبعا ما فيش بيت في غزة إلا بسب عليها لما تخرب القناة اللي بحضرها فيلم أو مباراة أو أخبار هي بصراحة أكثر شيء كمواطنة بحكي إنها بتعمل ضغط نفسي شديد إن هي مربوطة بالحرب وبالموت مجرد ما نسمع طائرة استطلاع في الجو بصير عندنا إحساس إنه حي يجي وراء قصف طبعا إحنا تعودنا إنه طائرة الاستطلاع تكون عايشة معنا كأنها كأنها جزء من من حياة غزة صارت 
وبتزيد في الحرب وبتصير في الحرب لها طابع القتل لانه بتبطل تجسس ومراقبه في الايام العاديه زي هاي الايام بتصير هي عامل قتل وفي عندي شويه احصائيات مثلا من 2008 لاكتوبر 2013 طائرات الاستطلاع قتلت 911 فلسطيني ومن اشهر اللي قتلتهم طائرات الاستطلاع هو الشيخ احمد ياسين في 2004 وايضا احمد الجعبري في 2011 كانت بطائرات من دون طيار احنا بنحس انه مثلا وانا صغيره في الانتفاضه الاولى كان في راجمات لعد الدباب اللي هي بترمي الحجار الصغار وكان في سطوح سبست في رفح في المخيم فما كان طبعا لها خوفها وقتها بس تطور اللي هالحين صار صار اعتماد على الطيارة بدون طيار لأنها هدفها أكثر دقة بحسب ما بتحكي إسرائيل وطبعا أكثر رعبا هذا معنا الطائرات بدون استطلاع في البيت في الحياة في هي عنا إن معناها أنه مش بس ضغط نفسي مش بس أنها بتخرب القنوات نحضرهاش مش بس أنه إحنا حاسين حالنا 24 ساعة مراقبين هي بتعني أنه في قتل جاي أنه في إنسان مستهدف بحسب ما إحنا بنعرف من خبرتنا الصغيرة أنه في نوع, نوع نفاث اللي هو التجسس والمراقب وفي نوع قاتل و وبطلق صواريخ او معادي وفي طيارات بتعمل الاثنين بتراقب وبتقتل طبعا كمان بنعرف بالمعلومات البسيطه انه انه هي يا اما بتطير زي المنطاد يا اما بالمراوح يا اما نفاثه بصراحه ما فيش طياره اهون من طياره لما تسمعها في الجو يعني الاباتشي كمان بالنسبه لنا رعب بالاف 16 اكثر رعبا خاصه انها الاف 16 كانت تعتمد عليها اسرائيل بالترهيب النفسي في صوت ال بصوت اللي كانت تعمله في الحرب 2011 بس الحرب الأخيرة زي حرب 2008 ما خلتش شيء إلا استخدمته يعني خاصة طائرة الاستطلاع في حرب 2000 الحرب الأخيرة ما عنديش إحصائيات بس بحرب 2011 مات 143 فلسطيني بهذه الطائرة طبعا ال 911 فلسطيني اغلبهم اللي ب 2008 اغلبهم مات في حرب 2008 و2009 من هذه الطائره ايضا طائره بدون طيار بدي احكي لكم طرفه هيك صغيره انه احنا بنسميهم زنانات وصارت كلمه زنان اللي هي درونز صارت جزء من من حياتنا اليوميه حتى احنا لما بدنا نحكي عن بعض الرجالات اللي متابعين للحكومه الامن او اللي هم براقبوا الحارات او الشباب يعني اللي بتابعين للامن اللي بشوفوا هذا ايش بيعمل هذا راح على الجامع هذا احنا بنسميهم كمان زنانات يعني صارت في الثقافه اليوميه من ممكن نقول عن اي حدا فضولي انت زنانه فكيف الدرونز دخلت حياتنا اليوميه او الطائرات الاستطلاع دخلت حياتنا اليوميه حتى في ثقافتنا ولغتنا وفي وصفنا لبعض انا بدي احكي شغله ثانيه حول قديش هلا منذ انتهاء الحرب لغاية 18 فبراير الماضي ست شهور بالضبط انتهت الحرب في 26-8-2014 لحد 18 فبراير 2015 طبعا احنا بنعيشش براحة احنا كل يوم حاسين انه بنحكي في حرب جديدة الناس بتسألنا في حرب جديدة كأنه احنا صحفين عنا اجابات في عنا اربعين اصابة على الحدود من الناس ساكنين على المناطق الحدودية عنا اثنين قتلى واحد منهم مقاوم والثاني صائد عصافير على الحدود برضه المناطق الحدوديه عندنا يعني ثلاث غارات على المناطق الحدوديه من احدهم من طائره بدون طيار وهي اللي قتلت المقاوم عندنا يعني تسع قوارب اتلفوا في هذه الست شهور 66 مدني تم اعتقالهم من ضمنهم الصيادين طبعا كل هاي الاحصائيات بتدل على انه ما فيش سلام يعني فيش هدنه حقيقيه الناس حاسين في طول الوقت انهم مهددين حسب احصائيه طلعت امبارح انه من من مؤسسات اغاثيه انه في عندك 100 الف فلسطيني في قطاع غزه لم يعد الى بيته بعد ولم يبني بيت بديل الوضع سيء كثير انا بعتقد انه احنا بنعيش بفتره ياس ليست فقط على مستوى الفقر والبطاله ياس ياس حقيقي اكثر من اي فتره سابقه اكثر من من ال 48 من 48 بحس حتى اجدادنا بيقولوا انه الوضع اليوم اسوء ما يكون البطاله الفقر الياس عند الناس يمكن في الحرب كان عندنا نوع من التفاؤل نسينا خلافاتنا الداخليه بين حماس وفتح نسينا الانقسام ولكن الان لحظه لحظه الياس وصلت الى اقصاها الخلافات رجعت زي الاول ما فيش افق ما فيش امل 
خلال الحرب كنا دائما عندنا امل كنا في ترابط كان في احساس انه في شيء جاي ايجابي لكن الان لا يوجد كاننا وقعنا في فراغ فعلا في فراغ يعني كثير صعب انا بحزن على الناس بحزن على وضع غزه رواتب 40 الف موظف لحد حكومه غزه السابقه حكومه حماس ما بتطلقوش رواتبهم ايضا موظفين السلطه من 30 36 الف بتطلقوا 60% من رواتب تخيلوا لما تحسوا مدينه كامله زي غزه فيها مليون و800 فرد ما فيش فيها حياه بالشوارع لانه فيش وضع الاقتصادي سيء ولما يصير الوضع الاقتصادي سيء تليها بنعكس على الامن تليها بنعكس على نفسيات الناس الوضع كثير سيء انا كان بتمنى اني اشارك بشكل ايجابي اكثر بس انا بحكي انه انه لسه لسه احنا الشباب الصغار عندنا امل عندنا امل بالتغيير عندنا امل انهم يتصالحوا عندنا امل انه نضخ دماء جديده ممكن ممكن شيء يتغير طبعا ليس فقط العمل الاقتصادي والياس والضغط النفسي والتهديد الاسرائيلي المحيط من الجو من البحر ومن الارض والحدود هو العامل اللي ضغط على اهل قطاع غزه احنا عندنا معبر رفح مغلق لمدة 235 يوم في 2014 العام الماضي لم يفتح إلا لمدة 125 يوم يعني شيء كتير محزن إنه بعد الربيع العربي والصراع السياسي اللي صار إحنا نحسب على إقليم معين ويتم معاقبة كل أهل قطاع غزة لسبب هذه الحسابات والصراعات السياسية كذلك الأمر مع المشاكل الداخليه في قطاع غزه اللي بتضغط على الناس اكثر واكثر، الاعتقال السياسي، قديش احنا ممكن نمارس حريه الراي والتعبير على السوشيال ميديا في الصحافه في المقالات للاسف كله يتجه نحو الانحدار بشكل سلبي، كذلك الامر في الضفه لا تختلف كثيرا عنا، الاعتقال السياسي، معاقبه الصحفيين، وضع قرارات ضد اي صحفي يكتب عن محمود عباس بشكل ساخر على الفيسبوك على سبيل المثال. هناك تنافس بين الضفة وغزة على الانتهاك انتهاكات والاعتقالات السياسية بشكل محزن جدا لا توجد مراعاة أبدا للانتظار الطويل الذي الذي انتظره الناس يعني وصبره طوال حرب ساحقة وقاتلة إنه يكون في أمل يكون في تعويض معنوي يكون في مصالحة لكن هذا لم يحدث على الإطلاق يعني هذا الشهر سيمر عام على اتفاق الشاطئ الذي لم ينفذ منه أي شيء على أرض الواقع شكرا Good evening My name is Laura Lucchini I'm a journalist uh, It is an honor and a privilege for me to be to introduce this panel tonight um, the idea was uh, born during a conversation we had with uh, the curator Tatiana Bazzichelli and uh, Chantal Meloni, who I will introduce later. Uh, and we had this chat and we were all um, interested in different aspects of uh, the robotizations of, of conflict uh, in different ways. Um, the use of weaponized drones uh, for targeted killings, uh, it is maybe the most obvious and actual aspect of this reality for different reasons. In the last 10 years, this practice has become widely used and more and more accepted, despite being highly controversial. Looking into facts uh, for the preparation of this panel, um, it got even more obvious to me that we were moving in a gray zone. For example, I had the idea to, to start with a, with a number, the number of the civilians killed as a collateral damage uh, during targeted killings. The problem is this question has no answer. Um, none of the, uh, the, the person killed with, the, with this operation uh, had the right to a process or, or the right uh, to the presumption of innocence. The governments uh, perpetrating uh, these attacks defend themselves from this accusation, saying that these were lawful war killings. But then again, the question is, uh, how is the battlefield defined? Is the word a battlefield? Here is a fact. 
targeted killings are here to stay. That's why I'm really happy to join this today's event to discuss this complex topic in a public debate. Currently, 87 countries have weaponized drones for military use, most of them for surveillance. Only three reportedly uh, used weaponized drones for targeted killings uh, in war operation. Those are Israel, the United States, and Great Britain. Talking about the European Union, many are collaborating in the target killings strategies of the United States. Germany with a leading role. In other words, as Brandon said before, this debate directly concerns all of us. We will now listen first to John Goetz. John Goetz is a US born Investigative, investigative journalist and author. He's based in Berlin since uh, 1989. He's probably right now the, the one of the most known investiga investigative journalists in, uh, in Germany. Uh, he is uh, currently the NDR editor for investigation uh, um, here in Berlin and member of the investigative team at the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, he's, among other things, the author of the book Geheime Kriege, Secret Wars, and uh, he will uh, uh, start with this panel tonight. Later, we will uh, uh, hear Chantal Meloni. Chantal Meloni is an Italian criminal lawyer and academic. In 2010, she conducted a research on the protection of the right to life in asymmetrical conflict uh, with the Humboldt University of Berlin and spent several months in Gaza Strip. So if you have any question about the video we saw, you can talk to her. Um, with the, uh, with the, uh, she was there working with the Palestinian Center of Human Rights. She's also the co-editor of uh, uh, the book, uh, Is There a Court for Gaza? And then we will speak to Marek Tushinsky. He is the creative director and co-founder of the collective Tactical Tech. Recently, he produced and directed a, seri a series of documentary films for this collected, uh, collective called Exposing the Invisible. The last episode of those uh, documentaries uh, explores the physical, moral, and political invisibility of US drone strikes in Pakistan. He will uh, tell us about what sort of narratives activists can build and what sort of issues they can investigate in the complex context of government secret operations. Then, John. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, oops. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, I wanted to talk about a, a story that we did for the Süddeutsche and for ARD that's kind of developed since then, but it's kind of, we, we had it, it came out in 2014, and it was basically um, 2013, an attempt to reconstruct one day when a drone attack happened in Somalia, and where we looked at kind of the different locations and the different places that all played a role in this one attack. And we're talking about February 23rd, 2012. Our story came out about a year and a half after that. Um, and the interesting thing about most of this research is that almost everything about this drone attack, believe it or not, that you'll hear tonight, with the exception of the victims, is online. And actually the American military puts an amazing amount of information online. And if you spend enough time Googling in .mil websites, it's really quite amazing what you can find. Um, but wasn't, what wasn't in there were the victims. Hi, John. Um, um, we managed to um, get the son of one of the victims uh, to come to Istanbul to meet with us because the crazy thing about Somalia is that Somalians can almost, there's very few places in the world Somalians are allowed to travel to. Um, um, and it was in Istanbul that we were able to hear the story of Salman Abdali and his father Maximed, who on the morning of February 23rd began their day like any other day, drinking tea. The son was responsible for the goats. We're talking about a nomadic family that moves frequently. Um, they were thinking of moving again because of a drought. Um, the camels that the father was out with that day um, had a, to travel a long way to find fresh grass. 
And you'll see that this question of fresh grass turned out to be very important in this man's life. Um, at the same time at Creech Air Force Base where Brendan, um, I'm not sure if he was still there at that point, um, there are very interesting documents that you can find online about what was going on exactly at that time. Um, and as I'm sure Brendan explained, um, a drone team is made up of very many people. And um, in, there was the launch and recovery pilot on that day um, who describes in a, in a report how he woke up, um, um, he had a late, the, the night shift, um, which was the morning in Somalia, obviously. Um, but because he had the night shift, he began his day with Cheerios, although it was 11 p.m., for breakfast. Um, started a different drone, uh, and then later on ordered a turkey sandwich um, and coffee while he was um, steering and involved in the launching of the drone. Um, the, and it's quite amazing the amount of material that's there. There are other, uh, other details from, from other members of the team on the same day. Assuming that the newspaper stories and a lot of the information about the, the other victim that day is true, I don't know that it's true, but uh, outside of Mogadishu at the same time as the Cheerios are being eaten and the nomads are drinking their tea, uh, Mohammed Sakra um, got into this convoy. Um, he apparently, was apparently a member of Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda affiliated group in Somalia. He's actually born in London. Uh, his parents are Egyptian. Um, and the UK revoked his citizenship while he was in Somalia uh, because he was accused of being a member of Al-Shabaab. Just a month earlier, and there's actually a, a fair amount of information also in the American Air Force websites about this as well, his best friend Berjavi, who also came from London, uh, was killed, and he was killed, and that's actually an interesting point about what Brendan mentioned earlier, um, because he turned on his phone to find out um, if his wife had indeed um, had a baby. And so the phone was on, and then that was the, and he was killed about a month earlier. So all at the same time at, the Ram, at Rammstein, if you move to Germany for a second, at the Air Operations Center, which is this, I've been inside the Air Operations Center, which it's a, 1,500 people work there. I mean, there are hundreds of screens. I mean, it's a massive place, and it's one of the, within Rammstein, it's a secret place within the secret zone. I mean, it's, it's got a whole bunch of levels of security, which are uh, unusual. Um, the AOC is responsible for all, I don't know if this has all been said 20 times before, I hope not, um, is responsible for monitoring all air operations in Africa. Because, as I'm sure, or maybe some of you know, um, AFRICOM, the military command for Africa, is based in Stuttgart. And it's quite interesting because the Bundesregierung continually says, you know, we have no information that drone attacks are being done out of Germany. And they quote uh, in questions that uh, Herr Strobel has asked many times, um, they quote Obama, who says, uh, no drone strikes are launched from Germany. Well, no one ever claimed that drone strikes are launched from Germany. The, co the claim is, is that the coordination happens in Germany. And it, there's actually, it's a very interesting thing. The US president is obligated every six months to send a letter to Congress saying what are the military activities that the United States is involved in in the world. Uh, and he lists every six months in this letter to Congress that we're not talking about CIA attacks in Africa. These are military attacks. This letter has to do with military activities. And he lists drone attacks and drone executions. And then if you go to AFRICOM and you say, are you responsible for those drone attacks? Dr AFRICOM, which is based in Stuttgart, they say that every military activity in Africa is our responsibility. So there's actually kind of no way out of this, but the Bundesregierung continues to say they have no idea about it. Um, so the, the name of Sakra, the person who was in that Al-Shabaab convoy that day, 
um, he gets nominated. I don't know if this was mentioned earlier, but there's a, a whole nomination process, it's called. And then on this Terror Tuesday, which is the day that Obama makes the final decision um, whether someone gets executed or not, um, the different military commands have to propose the nominations. And then they get discussed, the intelligence gets talked about. And unlike, I think many Germans may think or may not think, I'm not sure that you know, they just say kill them all, there's actually an extremely complex process of you know, military jags, military lawyers who look at this. Now the end result is that a lot of civilians die, don't, don't get me wrong, but there's an extremely complex process of lawyers looking at this, does this meet the um, um, standards for an execution and all of that. And actually, drone targeting lawyers, it's an entire profession in the United States. There's a, there are special chairs at universities, at military universities, that are targeting experts. And it's a very complex science. And actually, if you, if you are interested in it, I mean, those drone attorneys, the people who approve or don't approve the attacks, are very happy to talk about their standards. And I mean, they're very interesting people. I mean, and, and, um, and there's a lot of information about their activities online and how they make decisions and things like that. Um, so at the same time as the Cheerios and the, and the, um, and the convoy leaves and the nomads go with their animals, um, in Djibouti um, is where the actual drones are based. It's a, it's a base called Camp Lemonnier. They have the um, symbol, they're called the East African Air Pirates, and they have a symbol of a, of a, it's, uh, of a skull. That's the thing with two crossbones. Um, and they wear this badge, and you can buy the badge online, by the way, if you want to, and it's called East African Air Pilots, and we bought them. I mean, it's, they're um, quite striking. Um, it, um, and Camp Lemonnier, which used to be a French legionnaire's base, is completely controlled by Stuttgart. It belongs to Stuttgart in the American military categories, in the way things are done. There's no question that it belongs to Stuttgart. I don't, it's hard to imagine anyone arguing differently, but um, that happens. Um, As I said, there was a problem with this drought and there were a problem with lions on that day. Um, and so the father, Maximed, had to go over an hour away from their home um, to find fresh grass. Um, and uh, what was interesting also about Maximed in the kind of, I, I had never met nomads before and there were a number that came to meet with us there. Um, there weren't kind of court systems in the normal system, but Maximum was a kind of decision maker in the community and people came to him if there were issues about water or disagreements. Um, and um, interestingly, uh, we asked his son if there's any photos. There are no photos and apparently n nomads in this area of Somalia ha have a issue with photography and don't want pictures taken. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so at Rammstein, um, um, you, you know, as I'm sure Brendan mentioned before, there's, there's an internal chat system where Rammstein, Djibouti, Stuttgart, Creech Air Force Base, um, and all of the other places are connected with each other. They're all, uh, you can actually, again, if you spend enough time online, you can find transcripts of these not for this specific attack, but you can, you'll see there's dozens of names on these chat systems. Because there have been, there've been investigations to drone attacks in Afghanistan, for example, and then there'll be 15,000 pages, and I don't mean that as an exaggeration, of documents having to do with some drone attack that didn't go well or whatever. And then you can go through and they have all these transcripts of these drone protocols. Um, and if you look at that, you can kind of, and then talk to Brendan, you get a sense of, of these, how many different people are there. And there are these military lawyers always involved in this. So they're also looking at the feed, right? Um, life in Djibouti, where the drones are based, is also astonishingly well documented on these military websites. Um, am I taking too long? Um, 
you'll see, um, for example, is interviewed uh, different times for different kind of military issues, and he's very upset about karaoke. He talks about how his, the place where he sleeps is five feet away from the local karaoke thing. And the problem with the drone operators, the people who actually launch them there, is they're not allowed to drink alcohol um, because they can be called to service at any time. And they have to sit there in the, one of the hottest places of the world in these tents. And he has to be five feet, which is just a couple meters away from the karaoke bar. So there's kind of amazing stuff of him talking about not being able to sleep and, and uh, and how he hates karaoke. And then they all complain about, in these interviews, having to do with other things, about how the um, Somalis in Djibouti, I mean, Djibouti is basically the ethnic Somalis who live there, um, how they don't speak English well, the air traffic control people, and they're very upset with the air traffic control people. And, and that was, I think, one of the reasons for an investigation is how do we deal with the fact that the air traffic control staff don't speak English well enough for the American air traffic control people to talk to them. Um, and this goes on and on. You can, I mean, you can spend a lot of time reading all this stuff. So the area where Maximed, the, the nomad, eventually found this grass was actually um, near the Shabeli River. It's very close to the Indian Ocean. Um, and it's a region also where, his, where he lives where he lived in general, was also, that's controlled by al-Shabaab. Um, so, um, just one point about where does the intelligence come from, because Brendan had mentioned earlier, correctly, obviously, about cell phones and all of that. Well, it's not just cell phones. I mean, one of the things when you talk to people from military intelligence, and I'm sure there's some here, could, I mean, they love human intelligence. That's the thing that they're mostly excited about. And one of the ways that Germany has played a very important role is that there are lots of Somali refugees in Germany. I mean, if you go to the Munich Hauptbahnhof, I mean, it's just, there's, that, there's one cafe which is filled with Somalis. I mean, there's lots of Somalis, especially in Bavaria. Um, but they're also uh, all over Germany. And there's been, for many, many years, a thing called the Hauptstelle für Befragungswesen, which maybe some of you have heard about. The Hauptstelle für Befragungswesen is this kind of dead non-name that the German intelligence service, the BND, has given for their intelligence gathering operation uh, for refugees. So any Somali that comes here um, gets questioned up and down about streets, shops, anything. I mean, it's really quite amazing the amount of information they gather. <clears throat> and it is a American, German, British cooperative, they call it a tripartite operation. So the Somalis who are questioned um, are, um, it's all part of this kind of German, American, British program. <clears throat> and all of that information flows into the American targeting system. So when the German government goes on and says that, you know, we don't provide any information, they could lead to an execution. If you talk to any of these targeting professors, you know, I mean, they just giggle when they hear that. I mean, the idea that, that the information that Somalis provide about streets or about locations or where is Al-Shabaab or where were they two years ago, that all goes into a very complex system of targeting. Because I think a lot of us have this idea that, <clears throat> and, the, and the SPD was doing this when it, during BND in Baghdad. They were saying, we never provided the coordinates for an attack. Well, but, I mean, that's, that's just not how targeting works. I mean, it, and it's really worth talking to some of these targeting people because it's, they put in information from all directions to try to come up with their standards that they need to get to. <coughs> and this information, this human intelligence, from Somali refugees is very important. We don't know exactly what happened to Maximed, um, other than, or at least his son was, was obviously not an eyewitness, he was somewhere else. He noticed, first of all, that his father did not come home that night, and then later on, before they went to bed, the camels came back without his father. The next morning, he was still missing. The family went out to try to find him, and they found a woman who actually sold milk who had t told them about the fact that someone had been killed in a drone attack and that there were destroyed cars. So the family went to find him 
uh, and they did indeed find his body. Um, and Al-Shabaab has a prohibition on um, funerals. For whatever reasons, you're not allowed to have a funeral. I don't, you know, you're not allowed to honor other people than Allah. I don't really understand why not. Um, and so they buried him there, basically at the site of the drone attack. Um, the Al Shabaab people had already picked up their bodies. That's one of the things that they do. And it was actually one of the, um, you know, crazy things as a journalist you have to do is, well, was he Al Shabaab or not? Um, you know, does that make the story less interesting? if he should have been killed, right, you know, whatever. But the fact that his body was there after the attack is a strong sign that he wasn't al-Shabaab because the other bodies were taken. And now just a last point um, about the photography issue. <laughs> there are no photos of him, perhaps, um, except for one photo or video footage that is probably in an American computer somewhere. Um, from February 23rd. Thanks, John. We will now uh, zoom out, let's say, with, uh, with Chantal. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah, OK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana, and all the organizers of this uh, great event for the invitation. I'm really happy and honored to be here, speak uh, after uh, so prominent uh, people. I feel a little bit humbled. Uh, and I'll try today to put uh, this issue of uh, the drone strikes, uh, and more specifically, the targeted killing conducted by the drones in the legal framework, which I know is not the best uh, uh, thema to speak about on a Friday evening, so <laughs> I already beg your pardon if some concepts will be a little bit technical, but I'll try to be simple and easy, and I also want to start with some facts. Um, I'm not myself an in investigative journalist, of course, uh, but I rely on the data collected by investigative journalists, and these data say that uh, up to 5,500 uh, people were killed uh, by drone strikes uh, since 2004 in Yemen, uh, Pakistan, Somalia. According to the data of the Bureau for Investigative uh, Journalism, in the last decade the U.S. has launched more than 500 strikes. Uh, in these countries, uh, and uh, we have to note immediately that these are countries where the U.S. is not at war. So we are not counting the strikes in other places like Iraq, Afghanistan, where there is a declared state of war. And killing, uh, we can say that have, has uh, supplanted the capture as the centerpiece of the U.S. Uh, counterterrorism uh, strategies, drones, uh, have uh, supplanted Abu Ghraib uh, and Guantanamo as a symbols uh, of this uh, globally expanding uh, war on terror. And the opposition to this practice, uh, the drones, the targeted killing, is growing, but not yet, uh, is not yet as effective uh, as it was uh, the opposition against torture. And this may be because, as we will see, the legal framework uh, is more complex. It is well known that under the Obama administration, targeted killing have escalated and expanded. And in Pakistan alone, the Obama administration reportedly killed, uh, well, launched uh, nine times as many strikes as the Bush administration and in few years of office. Uh, but I want to stop here with number because I know that tomorrow Jack Searle from the Bureau of Investigative Just, uh, Journalism will be speaking. My point is just that the numbers are huge. And the numbers are worrying, uh, and what is even more worrying is the lack of transparency by the governments. States uh, have failed to specify the legal justification for the targeted policy. Most troubling, they have uh, refused to disclose who has been killed, for what reasons, uh, and with what collateral consequences. Notably, uh, John already mentioned, the individual targets are put on the kill list for assassination with no judicial oversight. Uh, 
and there is no public presentation of evidence. Uh, President Obama personally approves uh, the list of those who are designated to be targeted, uh, often by covert drone operations, this nomination that uh, John was talking about, in foreign countries. And the information on the kill list uh, is not officially given by the administration, and it is limited, uh, what we have, uh, to media reporting and leaks uh, by US, uh, Pakistani, Somali, or other officials. So the question is, who was killed? The lack of transparency in this regard reaches levels of absurdity. According to the organization Reprieve, reports suggest that some individuals on the kill list would have died as many as seven times. More specifically, Reprieve identified 41 cases of men, each of whom was targeted and reported killed more than three times on average because they were before they were actually killed as it is evidently impossible to die twice, this bears the question, who was killed instead? But in most cases, this question remains unanswered, as the vast majority of the killed people remained unnamed. The same source reports that in total, as many as 1,147 people may have been killed during attempts to kill these 41 targets. And this, of course, raises huge doubts, strong doubts about the precision of the intelligence behind the decision to proceed with a drone strike. As a former Defense Department advisor, her name is Rosa Brooks, put it, and here I quote, right now we have the executive branch making the claim that it has the right to kill anyone, anywhere on earth, at any time, for secret reasons, based on secret evidence in a secret process undertaken by unidentified officials. <laughs> exactly. The governments may keep denying it, but one thing is clear, that drones have become a deadly routine for some states. And this reality is well documented in several reports uh, so far, including UN Special Rapporteurs uh, on extrajudicial summary and arbitrary execution. In the contemporary debate, uh, the drone strikes and the targeted killing are specifically associated uh, with the US uh, counterterrorism strategy post September 11. However, Everything started uh, long ago, and actually not in the United States. Israel has the longest track on targeted killings, uh, and was the first country in the world to openly acknowledge uh, such a policy. The very same term, targeted killing, which is not a legal term, uh, despite the frequency with which it is invoked in legal debate, uh, came into common usage uh, in the year 2000, uh, when Israel made public its policy of targeted assassinations of Palestinians on the occupied Palestinian territory during the Second Intifada. Since then, uh, the term has been used in several contexts uh, to indicate uh, the state-sponsored practice uh, of eliminating the enemies, uh, in particular outside their territories. And although the practice of targeted killing started well before the entry into force of drones, it is a fact that since this technology was made available, the number of targeted killings escalated. And it is not a case that 60% of the world's drones exports come from Israel, according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. In particular, the Israeli military firm Elbit produces 85 of the drone's arsenal, including the best-selling model Hermes, which later version was also used in Gaza during the last offensive. The vast majority of the drone market, of course, is made of surveillance drones, meaning not armed. But predictions say that in 10 years, every country will have armed drones. For now, as Laura already mentioned, 
there are very few countries in the world uh, that have uh, known to have directly employed armed drones, uh, namely the United States, uh, United Kingdom and Israel. Uh, and there are claims about Pakistan and China, but uh, none of them openly speaks of it. Uh, and according to the UK research group uh, Drone Wars, uh, Israel, for instance, has never admitted publicly the use of armed drones in Gaza, despite the mounting evidence to the contrary. We heard uh, asthma before. <coughs> according to the recent data released by the Human Rights Center Al Mazan, around 37% of all casualties during 2014 operation in Gaza are attributable to drone strikes. And we're talking about more than 800 individuals killed only by drones. Thus, all this brings us to the question whether the introduction of drones in warfare operations creates new ethical, moral, uh, and legal issues. On the one hand, uh, it is clear that this technology makes it easier to conduct kill operations. Uh, from a military perspective, the drones offer advantages. They are cheaper, they are allegedly more precise than conventional uh, uh, strikes uh, committed by planes, manned uh, flights. Drones make it easier to kill without a risk uh, for uh, a state force, uh, and thus they may be a practical means of attacking targets uh, into difficult to reach uh, areas, uh, avoiding the risk of costs and costs of boots on the ground. In this sense, uh, yes, drones uh, may make uh, the targeted killing practice more at attractive uh, for policymakers, uh, for governments, uh, and could cause uh, an expansion of the targeted killing. As uh, Grégoire uh, Chamayou, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, <laughs> writes in his very interesting book uh, on the philosophical uh, foundation of the drones, uh, all this is consistent with the sort of new principle, uh, that of the immunity of the combatants, uh, which has emerged in recent times, uh, according to which the life of the soldiers uh, would be more important uh, than the life of the foreign civilians. Uh, but of course, uh, this is in, in contradiction with the principles uh, and established rules governing the armed conflicts. On the other hand, uh, I would argue that it is not the technology as such the problem. There were more dramatic changes uh, and technology advancement with regard to weapons and warfare conduct in the last century. Let us think, for instance, of the nuclear weapons. Uh, drones, uh, in the end, are controlled by individuals. Uh, these individuals are located in a military chain of command, uh, and they are responsible for the consequences of the drone attacks. Drones are not automatized and fully autonomous killer weapons, which, by the way, already exist, but are a separate issue. So drones, in principle, are not different to other targeted killing techniques. And the critical legal question is the same for each kind of weapon, and it is whether its use complies with the international humanitarian law, which is the law that regulates armed conflicts. So I would argue that the critical aspect is not the technology as such, but rather the twist of the legal principles regulating the armed conflict, the armed operations. And this is where the states are being utterly ambiguous. Some commentators make the argument that we are in front of a gray zone, Laura quoted it, uh, an unregulated space for killing between war and peace. I don't believe so. And most importantly, I believe that it is very dangerous uh, to insist uh, on the existence of such a gray zone. Once you create uh, a state of exception, something in between uh, the recognized legal system, systems, uh, you cannot control uh, who will make use of it. So few legal concepts, really few, are necessary in order to understand why, despite uh, state's affirmation of the contrary, the modern practice of targeted killing is generally unlawful uh, under international law. 
And in simple terms, as again, I am aware it's Friday evening and <laughs> we are not in a low faculty, there are two distinct regimes uh, that uh, exist under international law. One applicable uh, during wartime and one applicable uh, in peacetime. In wartime, the law is more permissive uh, regarding the use of lethal force. What is permissible in war, typically to kill the enemy, as a rule is not permitted outside the battlefield. Still, the use of lethal force in an armed conflict is not unlimited, and it has to comply with a number of principles. First of all, the most important is, of course, the principle of distinction between military and civilians, where civilians are protected from direct attack. The law provides also other standards to be respected in conducting, in conducting such an attack. Proportionality, military necessity, precaution. Sorry. Outside the battlefield, the permissibility of the use of lethal force is much more restricted. There must be an absolute necessity as opposed to military necessity. Absolute necessity means that the use of lethal force aims exclusively at protecting human life from an unlawful attack and it must be absolutely necessary for the achievement of that aim. In particular, this means that if there are non-lethal alternatives, they have to be preferred. Outside the conduct of hostilities, no person can be lawfully deprived of their life based on criteria other than their conduct at the moment of the recourse to lethal force. Definitely not based on their past behavior, except death penalty for those states like the United States that accept the death penalty, or their mere belonging to a group or category. For instance, the terrorists, a terrorist group as such. So what is the problem? The problem is that states have expanded the concepts of war or battlefield as to include also situations that should actually be regulated under the more restrictive law enforcement regime. And such policies are often justified in public discourse as a necessary and legitimate response to terrorism, asymmetric warfare, but they had the very problematic effect of blurring and expanding the boundaries of the applicable legal fame framework. In fact, the so-called war on terror is a misleading expression because legally speaking, it does not amount to an armed conflict as a wall. Contrary to the US claims, uh, targeted killing of suspected terrorists uh, outside the battlefield in Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, are not regulated by the laws of the armed conflict, but rather by the more restrictive paradigm of the law enforcement. So the expansion, this expansion of the armed conflict paradigm, pa paradigm <laughs> both temporally and geographically, reminds, I would say, of the concept of uh, total war, for which there is no conceivable end or boundaries, since the number of enemies is inf infinite. As an evidence of this, the authorization to use military force passed in the, in, in the US legislation three days after the Twin Towers attack, was stretched as to include all Al-Qaeda associated and even non-associated forces, as we now see with Daesh attack against the so-called ISIS forces. Moreover, even when the laws of war are clearly applicable, the problem is that the states have expanded uh, the concept of who can be considered as a permissible target uh, and under which conditions. So just the last remarks, uh, also taking into consideration what are the arguments uh, used uh, 
by the states, uh, those who advocate uh, in favor of the legitimacy of the targeted killing do so around the concept of self-defense, anticipatory self-defense against non-state actors, uh, non-controlled by other states. So the people who are designated for death in this manner, in the kill list, uh, would pose an imminent and continuous threat. And because their capture is not possible, for instance, in remote zones of Pakistan, killing them would be the only available means of preventing that threat. So targeted killings and drone strikes against suspected terrorists would be equivalent to killing enemies during direct hostilities and therefore be a legitimate uh, act even outside the battlefield. However, the self-defense argument requires states to only use force for defensive aims and only once non-lethal options, meaning capture, have been exhausted. And the facts are that in many cases, the declared concept of imminent threat, which appears to be very arbitrary, is non-existing. The Department of Justice memo on drone strikes specifies that the condition that a terrorist presents an imminent threat does not, and here again I quote, require the US to have clear evidence of a specific attack in the future. So <laughs> a similar superficial reading of the necessity requirement uh, allowed many uh, individuals to be killed rather than captured. And if we have time, now I want to stop, but if we have time in the next uh, pan in the Q&A, I'd like to talk to you about a case uh, uh, of Mohammed al farek is a US citizen and uh, he is one good example of someone who was originally to be put on the kill list and then two years later was actually possible to capture him uh, showing that it is in fact possible if the government wants adopt alternative measures. So, just to conclude, the majority of the targeted killings outside the battlefield, as those we have talked about, constitute from a legal perspective premeditated deprivations of life, and they can only be very rarely justified with the absolute and immediate necessity with the meaning of self-defense. In this sense, they constitute violations of the right to life, and they can even amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. And states do have an obligation to investigate these alleged crimes. But so far, accountability was too difficult for lack of transparency and information, and therefore we are in front of a huge accountability vacuum that we can maybe talk more later in the Q&A. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Because exactly the lack of transparency that leads us directly to the next speaker, uh, Marek Tushinsky. You have the word now. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, how are you uh, all feeling? Can I ask you? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Uh, how are you feeling? Because I'm feeling completely fried. Um, and uh, because of the fantastic speakers before me, also everything important has been said to the extent that I twice forgotten what I wanted to tell you. But I try to do my best, so I figure out that maybe what I try to do is to tell you a narrative and a story where I won't use a word drawn a single time uh, for change. Uh, we're waiting for an uh, image to appear, which is trying to appear through the blue screen of death. Um, and it should come up in a second. Maybe I should do it. Um, it, it. It should go twice up, right? Is it there? Oh, oh great. Um, so I, I will tell you a few things, and I show you uh, a video and images from the film called Unseen War. And all the images you're going to see are uh, from this film. Um, First, I would like to give you a thank you. I was about to ask for that lights, but uh, somebody is amazing. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, I would like to tell you, first of all, the context of the, 
of the film. So Unseen War is part of the, I'm not gonna speak more than 15 minutes, so no worries, and there's only eight screens you're gonna see. Um, it's a part of the Exposing the Invisible, which is a series of documentary films, interviews, and resources that are focusing on new forms of investigation where uh, journalists, artists like James Bridle, whose work you see on the screen right now, which is the shadow of a drone, uh, reporters, uh, technologies, and so forth, collaborating on new forms of investigation where they explore publicly accessible data, evidence, and information to try to counter the mainstream stories. And Unseen War is a culmination of this series that is mostly focusing on showcasing their work, uh, where we as Tactical Tech, which is an organization based here in Berlin, took uh, the theme of uh, war, new warfare in Pakistan as an example of how technology is changing the landscape and environment of uh, political activism and how we can understand broader context of use of this technology. So I start from the first clip from the, from the film and hopefully there's sound. If you Google drone, the first image result is a picture of uh, what appears to be a a Reaper drone firing a missile. Um, and this, this image, because it's the first result on Google, this is the power that that gives it, has been endlessly uh, transmitted uh, through the media, endlessly reproduced. And you see it everywhere from kind of the front page of newspapers to um, kind of activist reports. And, and the origins of that image are in a 3D hobbyist forum online. Some guy a few years ago created it, um, modeled it in 3D, um, painted it in Photoshop, put it on a background of some mountains. Um, that drone doesn't exist. And so the most widely distributed image of this kind of incredibly liminal, strange technology is itself a dream. Um, this, is the, this is the beginning of the, of the story that consists of six uh, interviews with uh, three people who are experts from the ground from, from Pakistan and three people who are from outside. And all of them is trying to stitch a narrative from different sources possible. And what we've learned through the uh, research and, and work uh, with them is that there's a lot of information out there. Uh, we know a lot about w what's happening uh, with certain limits. So there's a lot of estimations and assumptions and so forth. Nevertheless, um, the major question remains, which is how is it possible that for over a decade, over 10 years, there is a targeted killing program in operation and existing frameworks, uh, legal uh, human rights or war frameworks that we established after the Second World War so proudly are not applicable. Why is it that uh, such a targeted killing program is in operation? And we also look at some numbers, and I'm going to show you an infographic from the film that is um, in a way showing you certain process that uh, it reveals to, to the numbers. Um, This is obviously an estimation. Uh, we, we don't know the actual numbers, and you probably will hear tomorrow more, more from the Bureau of Investigative uh, Journalism how they actually build this database and try to illustrate uh, what, is, what is happening. For me, more important story that I'm trying to kind of lead to that will be a, a conclusion of this little uh, presentation is that um, um, we are extremely interested in, in numbers. And, we, we can go into discussion about is it a, a great number or not. Is you know, 4,000 people 
big enough to make a fuss. If you look at um, how many migrants in the same period died trying to access Europe, that's uh, 10 times more. And there's no debate, no discussion about that. Uh, the, the discussion we have are focusing on the, on the tool, on the device, or the operators of the device. Uh, we are all curious about you know, how these guys who are flying drones are you know, frying the eggs uh, for lunch and how the rooms looks like, uh, what's going on there. We, we have this kind of um, human curiosity in detail, but it ends uh, when we have to look at technology and systems behind technology. And what we were interested in these stories was um, what kind of political environment that creates for, on one hand, those who abuse power to create these systems, on the other hand, for those who historically and usually would counter this power in some ways, uh, but are disabled, they don't have any more uh, ways of uh, explaining what actually is, is happening in a political sense. So that led us to another take on uh, what's happening there in the context of uh, power and counterpower. <coughs> There can seem to be a cartoon-like distribution between uh, power and counterpower, where uh, where power um, knows and um, is quite uh, sort of sophisticated in its um, ir 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 ironic, ironic or cynical appreciation of the situation. So yes, we know that you know the public good is just a story or. Um, yes, of course, we know that um, this is a dirty business. While then counterpower um, gets pushed into this role of uh, defender of purity, you know, virtue, etc. That is really um, something that um, information activism and digital mapping has to be really wary of, of being pushed in that role of being the idealist um, who cannot appreciate how things really happen or are really done. Because so often a br the broader context of public debate is that we all know we're just having this debate where we're claiming to care about these issues, but then we know that elsewhere something else happens. So what I would like is for um, information activism or the left or whatever name you uh, want to give to these counterpowers, that they also build that intelligence in their own practices that, yes, we know that in different settings, different rules apply, that the government is a different beast in different spaces. For us, just to end with uh, a few conclusions, so I would say the importance of looking at these operations of uh, surveillance armed systems in, in Pakistan was to actually make the parallel between already existing surveillance systems that we all are part of and uh, they do not require any machines flying over us because we already are inside the system in which we collect information about ourselves and it enables uh, specific intelligence gathering and it can classify us as, as different political actors. So there are a few very important issues that um, this physical geopolitical operation in Pakistan is actually legitimizing. So first of all, it is legit legitimizing persistent and permanent surveillance, uh, where it is okay to gather information, all of the possible information about any individual. And it is very actually difficult to do that using drones that require very high-end technology, but it's much easier to do it by corporations that are running uh, social media and other uh, services, uh, because we give them all the information for, for exchange for these services. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that we do not look at that problem in this uh, parallel. Uh, secondly, it's also legitimizing a multi-layer kind of total surveillance system where as we learned from previous talks, uh, for drone operator, it's very hard to uh, gather data from antennas, GSM, etc. For in similar systems on the ground, there's no problem of gathering that uh, information about any single individual that is part of the system or is outside of the system. Because the other thing, uh, what these operations are legitimizing are two aspects of surveillance that we are part of as well. Uh, so one is the uh, schematization of the behavior. 
as we learn, nobody is targeted by who they are, but how they behave, and they can be killed a few times because nobody actually checked if they were who they were, but if they behave like they should be behaving, and so forth. So what we're doing now in this uh, surveying systems, we, we build models of, of behaviors that would make those who are in power of controlling information make the clear distinction between who is good, who is bad, who is engaging with wrong networks, who is engaging with right networks, and so forth. And also, it is legitimizing and creating a system of um, detection of outliers, detection of uh, uh, kind of misbehaviors, because what uh, we learn from this deployment of, this, of, of the surveillance system out there to, um, to all actually the talks you, you've heard is that it's not actually important to see everybody. Uh, what is important to see is if somebody is misbehaving, is trying to do something different than the normal pattern of their behavior, and that classifies them as somebody that should be pre-empty uh, eliminated. And it doesn't have to be elimination in a, in a real sense like it is happening in Pakistan, but it may be in a political sense, that is somebody that has to be put under special observations or removed from the spectrum of political activities. And for us, focusing on on, on this problem that we are here for, and that was the main reason of looking at technology, because as tactical tech, um, we do few things. So, first of all, I told you about the exposing the invisible that is looking at new forms of investigation, but that's kind of more positive kind of a work, looking at the fact that in the sea of information, we can still gather ar around um, enough information to try to understand systems that are behind it. What, is the, uh, what are the creators? Technology is designed by people, and technology is uh, neither good nor bad, but is never, absolutely never neutral. It depends how, how and by whom is deployed and uh, what consequences that, that brings. So exposing the invisible is looking at the positive side that there's a lot of information out there that using our skills of activists, artists, and so forth, we can gather. Uh, we do that also in the context of trying to explain to people what it means to operate in the digital space, where most of our activities and behaviors are gathered, analyzed through our digital behavior, not necessarily through the physical one. And so for we run this series of projects around politics of data that are explaining what is the context of use of new technologies uh, that we all focus in the military sense, but as we know, they proliferate other aspects of our life and are very quickly picked up by uh, corporates and, and governments around the world. And if you're good at exposing the invisible, which is new forms of investigation, and you understand the environment, you sooner or later will be, you know, will have a problem with uh, technology as well. So the loop is closing. Uh, in a sad way, so we also offer uh, tools and tactics around digital security where uh, we offer people kind of overview of what's out there, etc. Um, maybe I should click this one. And that's it, I, I don't really have anything else to say. Thanks a lot. Please stay here, we will have now...